Good evening, and welcome to NTD News. I'm Steve Lance, in for Stephania. Biden announced a six executive actions he's taking to tighten gun rules, but he says he wants to do even more. A shooter in South Carolina killed five people before killing himself. Police believe the suspect was a former NFL player. New York reports the highest daily virus case average in the country. A Harvard professor tells us what's behind the surge. A human smuggling network based in Pakistan is busted. The network allegedly smuggled migrants from the Middle East into the United States across the U.S.-Mexico border. The price? $20,000 per person. And one Shanghai airport is secretly collecting foreigners' private information. The details could potentially be accessed by high-level authorities in China. President Biden is taking executive action on gun control. Today, he unveiled steps the administration will take immediately. But Biden says he wishes he could do even more. NTD's Melina Wisecup has more from the White House. Biden's immediately taking six executive actions on gun control. Within the next two months, the Justice Department will issue a proposed set of rules to stop the increase in ghost guns or homemade guns and expand the National Firearms Act to short-barreled rifles, meaning if someone buys a brace for a pistol, they must register them with the Secretary of the Treasury and pay a $200 fee. Biden pushed back on claims that his executive actions are an overreach. He called it bizarre to think his actions violate the Second Amendment. There are phony arguments suggesting that these are Second Amendment rights at stake from what we're talking about. But no amendment, no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. The Justice Department will also publish a model for red flag laws to encourage states to pass these laws. Red flag laws allow family members or police to petition for a court order that would temporarily take firearms away from people who may present a danger to themselves or others. I want to see a national red flag law. He also wants the Justice Department to issue an annual report on gun trafficking to help stop guns from reaching the hands of criminals. Biden used the uptick in crime to advocate for stricter gun control laws. But some say there's more context to consider about the rise in crime. You have the district attorneys who are not prosecuting a lot of cases. Crime is going up. Look at no bail now for many uh, crimes where people are not even required to have a bail. That is causing crime to go up. Biden also wants to make it possible for victims of gun violence to sue gun manufacturers. And some worry about how this would play out long term. So that if a criminal committed a crime with a gun, the manufacturer could be sued for the damages, which would put every gun manufacturer in America out of business. But Biden says he wishes he could do even more. We should also ban assault weapons and high capacity magazines in this country. Also with these executive actions, Biden's investing $1 billion towards gun violence intervention programs. He also wants to set aside another $5 billion towards these programs, and that is included in his infrastructure package. Biden's also calling on Congress to pass more gun reform laws so that they'll be longer lasting. But we know legislation like this does face an uphill battle in the Senate because of that thin majority. That is, unless Democrats can figure out a way to get around the filibuster. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weisscup, NTD News. Biden also nominated gun control activist David Chipman to serve as director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Biden called it the key agency to enforce gun laws. Governors and lawmakers are chiming in on what they think of Biden's proposed gun rules. Some say his actions infringe upon the Second Amendment. Others say they help reduce violence. NTD's Kevin Hogan has the details. Pleasure of getting to meet him. President Biden claims his executive orders on guns won't infringe on the Second Amendment, but South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem sees it otherwise. She says taking away guns with red flag laws is an infringement. The Second Amendment states the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. According to the Library of Congress, the meaning of the sentence is not self-evident and has led to a lot of interpretations, but the Supreme Court hasn't made very many decisions on it. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi agrees with Biden's plans. She claims his actions will help save lives and reduce community violence. According to GunViolenceArchive.org, over 11,000 people have died from some form of gun violence this year, but most of those were from suicides. 132 of those were from mass shootings. 
According to Giffords Law Center, gun homicides disproportionately affect black Americans. Texas Governor Greg Abbott says Biden is threatening gun rights. He wants to make Texas a Second Amendment sanctuary state. Ohio Representative Mike Loichik says Americans need to stand up for their rights now before it's too late. In February, he introduced the Second Amendment Safe Haven Act. It would designate Ohio as a Second Amendment protective state. The bill affirms that states have the right to defend liberties over the federal government. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. A horrific shooting in South Carolina took the lives of five people on Wednesday evening. The suspect is identified as a former NFL player who is also dead from self-inflicted wounds. Entity's Allison Lee has the latest. Investigators believe 33-year-old former NFL player Philip Adams is the suspect in the deadly South Carolina shooting. He is believed to have killed five people before ending his own life. Once the investigation began, uh, we were able to develop uh, Philip Adams as a suspect uh, in this incident. We also learned that Mr. Adams lived close to, to where this incident took place, just down the road. On Wednesday night, police responded to calls about a shooting in New York County, South Carolina, near Charlotte, North Carolina. They found five people dead in their home, a prominent doctor, his wife, their two grandchildren, and one of his workers. Another person suffered gunshot wounds. On Thursday morning, police located Adams' home. At around 2.30 a.m., we confirmed uh, that Mr. Adams, Mr. Philip Adams, uh, that the suspect was deceased in a bedroom in the home. The sheriff says they didn't see the suspect shoot himself, but saw self-inflicted gunshot wounds on his body. They are unable to confirm if Adams was one of the doctor's patients. Adams was an NFL player from 2010 to 2015 and played for six different teams. The sheriff says Adams also had other criminal charges. Uh, we issued several traffic citations our traffic unit in February of 2021. Those were minor charges. Uh, and then he has some pending criminal charges from 2016 that occurred in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina. Two of the five victims were minors. The youngest one was just five years old. The only surviving victim is now hospitalized with serious wounds. Allison Lee, NTD News. Firearm-related background checks saw a record high in March. Gun sales are rising and ammunition is in short supply. Our reporter spoke with two gun experts in Washington state to find out more. Since the beginning of the pandemic, guns have been in high demand. That's according to Ryan Osbrink, a longtime gun owner, Marine veteran, and general manager of Wade's Eastside Guns in Bellevue, Washington. In uh, 2019, uh, which was a fairly slow year, we would see anywhere from 20 to 30 customers on average a day. In March of, of last year of 2020, we are now and still currently experiencing anywhere from 90 to 150 a day. Osbrink, also known as Oz, tells NTD several other factors also contribute to soaring gun sales. You know, there was COVID, there was a civil, uh, I, I don't know if I'd call it unrest, but the protests and, and you know, the, the instability uh, and then all of the politicians were pushing for, you know, anti-gun, I'm going to ban this. I, I don't the store also saw not only many new gun owners, but also a dramatic shift in demographics. Probably within the first couple of weeks, we saw a huge explosion of diversity in the gun store. We saw a lot of uh, new Asian customers, We saw a lot of new Asian customers. We saw um, a lot of different minority groups that that weren't usually in the gun store, just they flourished in here. And, and as new gun owners, people will learn how to fire them. Joe Porras, the director and instructor at the adjacent indoor firing range, told NTD there was an increase in range traffic and shortage of ammunition. The reason why we have such a shortage in ammo is not because of the government. It's because there's so many new people buying guns, they bought ammo. Many buyers have been stockpiling ammo. Yeah, we were out. We actually ran out of 9mm maybe three weeks ago. We were out of it for at least a week. And then we got finally our shipment in. Laws suggest recent hate crime incidents may be less common if more bystanders arm themselves. I strongly believe that taking away the right for people to own what they want to own for their own self preservation is a lot more harmful than, uh, you know, the unfortunate events that, that happened. 
Data shows Washington state had an almost 14 times increase in ammo sales during the first 100 days of the outbreak of COVID-19, also known as the CCP virus. And demand has not gone down since. Florida is the nation's cruise capital. They have three of the world's busiest ports. And now the state is suing the Biden administration to reopen the cruise industry. NTD's Christina Kim has the story. Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis said Thursday, quote, to be clear, no federal law authorizes the CDC to indefinitely impose a nationwide shutdown of an entire industry. He said this regulation is based on very little evidence and data. The lawsuit is asking the court to stop the CDC and Health and Human Services from imposing the conditional sale order. The CDC said they'd eventually reopen the cruise industry, but they'll keep the order in place for now. The CEO of Norwegian Cruise Line points out that the CDC treats similar industries differently. The CDC has shut us down for over a year now. I don't know of any other industry that uh, has suffered at the hands of any federal agency like we have. If the court doesn't undo the conditional sale order, the lawsuit says around 160,000 Floridians whose livelihoods depend on the cruise industry could lose everything. During just the first six months of the pandemic, Florida's cruise industry reportedly lost $3.2 billion in economic activity. And to date, over 6,000 former cruise employees filed for state unemployment. Del Rio says it's unfair that the cruise industry has to follow such strict requirements when others don't. Everybody on board is vaccinated. Everybody on board has to follow these science-based, very strict protocols. So the need for all this nonsense daily reporting? Do hotels report daily? Do airlines report daily? No one does. Governor DeSantis notes that cruising has resumed in other countries, meaning some Americans will be on cruise ships regardless, just not out of Florida. According to the Associated Press, industry leaders say there haven't been any new outbreaks tied to their ships. DeSantis says this lawsuit is to protect Floridians from government overreach. He says he believes they have a good chance at winning the case. Christina Kim, NTD News. New York was the center of the pandemic early in the crisis. Now it's happening again, reporting the highest daily case average in the country. NTD's Miguel Moreno has the story. The city that never sleeps is waking up, slowly. Restaurants, theaters, and other activities are still restricted, but now New York State's once again the nation's center of the COVID-19 epidemic. The daily case average peaked at nearly 11,000 late last month. They're going down now, but still the highest in the country as of Thursday. Michigan's reporting the second highest. But why are states with tighter pandemic restrictions reporting more cases than states like Texas? Professor Koldorf, we're in an interesting situation. So you have Michigan and New York. They're reporting the highest daily case averages in the country. Meanwhile, Texas is reporting far lower numbers, even though they have less pandemic restrictions, no statewide mass mandate, and a much larger population. So is this making sense to you? Uh, yes. It is. Why is it making sense? Well, uh, the, the lockdowns and the mass and the contact tracing, uh, to think that they can be used to suppress a pandemic or control it uh, is naive and misguided. So uh, it can be used to flatten the curve to uh, uh, temporarily to uh, make sure that hospitals are overwhelmed. But to think that you can get, that you can sort of postpone it indefinitely it is not possible. So uh, the, the lockdown, what it does, because people still have to work and they have to get food and so on. So what the lockdowns does is it, it protects the lower risk professionals, uh, journalists like you or scientists like me or bankers or attorneys and so on, while the working class, uh, older working class people who are high risk, they are being exposed. So uh, that's not good. That actually increases, the, uh, that creates unnecessary death because uh, while anybody can get infected, there's more than a thousand fold difference in the risk of mortality between the oldest and the youngest. In other words, Professor Koldorf says it's better that older, higher risk people be protected. But he says society should function without lockdowns for younger, lower risk people so the population eventually reaches herd immunity. More immunity in the population theoretically means less disease and death. Now, as for New York, Professor Koldorf says a lack of immunity is behind the recent surge. 
it has to do with how much immunity there is in the community. And in uh, New Yorkers have had, have had high mortality back in the, in the spring, for example, but that was of older people. And older people who get infected, uh, that leads to a lot of mortality, but it doesn't lead to a lot of uh, immunity in the community because they're not the major spreaders of disease, most of them. The CDC yesterday recommended that Michigan tighten up their restrictions and that the state increase vaccines in areas suffering more outbreaks. Koldorf said Michigan should go out of its way to vaccinate as many older people as possible to keep the death count low. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. The U.S. charges a Pakistani national with smuggling migrants into the United States. Over the course of five years, he allegedly smuggled clients from the Middle East through South and Central America and then across the U.S.-Mexico border. The Department of Justice said Wednesday that Pakistani national Abid Ali Khan has been charged and his assets seized for allegedly running a prolific human smuggling network between January 2015 and December 2020. That network is a transnational criminal organization based in Pakistan. Three other individuals involved in the network have also been charged. The criminals disguised themselves as a travel agency complete with their own website and Facebook page. The organization facilitated the illegal immigration of individuals from Pakistan and Afghanistan into the U.S., many of them entering through the U.S.-Mexico border. The U.S. Treasury says the network used a common travel route starting in the Middle East, transitioning through South and Central America, and ending at the southern border of the United States. ICE's Homeland Security Investigations, or HSI, in Miami, Panama, and Brazil were involved in the investigation. The Treasury stated that among those Khan's network smuggled were foreign nationals who may pose a national security risk to the U.S. or its interests. HSI Miami Special Agent Anthony Salisbury said the smuggling network is exploiting systemic vulnerabilities in order to move people with nefarious motivations into the United States. The average cost Khan's clients had to pay to be smuggled into the U.S. is 20000 USD per individual. This cost includes fees for fraudulent documents and passports, payoffs to corrupt officials, lodging along smuggling routes, and payments to facilitators in various countries. The number of migrants that Khan's network smuggled into the U.S. has not been released. The case is being handled by the Eastern District of Virginia. Texas Republican lawmakers have introduced a bill to overhaul election laws. Democrats in the state are pushing back, saying the proposed changes are unfair to minorities. This week, Texas lawmakers squared off in dueling press conferences about voting laws. A new bill introduced by the state's Senate Republicans is facing strict opposition from Democrats. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick says Texas is a leader in voter access. Texas has had one of the biggest increases in voter turnout, voter participation of any state in the country all under Republican leadership. Texas Democrats say the proposed law will restrict access and that it will make voting more difficult. They will close hours to a certain extent. They will stop the drive through voting, that they had no basis of determining that it was wrong. And they will continue to take power away from the local counties. Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner says that the new legislation is aimed at suppressing minority voters. And quite frankly, you cannot separate these bills from the attacks on Asians, Hispanics, Jews, Muslims, African Americans. Republicans argue that the bill is strengthening the integrity of the voting process. We need a secure and safe voting system. Don't you want your bank to be secure? You don't, do you want them to protect all of your money or just some of your money? Is it okay for someone to hack in and steal 10% of what you have or 5%? Or do you want all 100% of your money to be protected at your bank? That's how we should look at voting. Some of the changes in the bill include banning the practice of vote harvesting and getting rid of straight ticket voting. Voters will have to manually cast their vote for each person on the ticket, rather than checking one box for all candidates in a specific party.
The legislation had been deemed a top priority for Republicans in the Lone Star State, and we could see a vote on the proposed bill in the near future. A Chinese airport is secretly collecting foreigners' private information. It includes their name, photo, and date of birth. This information could potentially be accessed by China's high-level authorities. NTD's Don Ma has more. For those flying to China, Beijing has been secretly collecting foreigners' personal information at a Shanghai airport. Dating back to 2017, collected information includes names, photos, birth dates, and passport numbers. Children aren't even exempted. A nine-year-old's personal information was also collected. The database was discovered by Australian cybersecurity firm Internet 2.0. Its chief executive told the Australian Broadcasting Corporation that the database appears to feed into China's larger mass surveillance system. The database has records on over 5,000 foreigners. They were reportedly collected when they passed through Shanghai's Pudong International Airport. Among those that were tracked, there were around 700 Americans, 160 Australians, and around 100 British citizens. The information is stored on servers under the jurisdiction of China's main law enforcement authorities. Some of the people targeted are simply visitors, but some are professors, researchers, government workers, and major company executives, such as those from Apple, Microsoft, Pfizer, and even the U.S. State Department. Grammy-winning R&B singer Ashanti Shakoya Douglas was also found on the database. It's unknown if people were targeted randomly, but a senior analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute points out that it shouldn't be a surprise to any foreigner visiting China that they might be tracked. Don Ma, NTD News. Coming up, one of Harlem's most majestic churches is sold to a real estate company. The Gothic building has been a place of worship for Catholics for over 100 years. And the mayor of Philadelphia is facing a lawsuit over alleged discrimination against Italian-Americans. It has to do with Columbus Day. That and more on NTD News. A real estate company is the new owner of a new church in New York. The historic All Saints Church is set for a big transformation, at least on the inside. NTD's Sapphire Quarter has the story. Nicknamed the St. Patrick of Harlem, All Saints Church's tall bell tower, its intricate Gothic design, and round windows helped make it an official New York City landmark in 2007. I remember All Saints from the time I was a boy. It was certainly the most magnificent church in Harlem. There was nothing compared to All Saints. Two weeks ago, the Archdiocese of New York sold the church to real estate investment firm CSC Co-Living for $11.35 million. According to CSC's website, the company provides money for co-living projects in the United States. An All Saints pastor says CSC's use of the site must respect the values of the Catholic Church. Because the church is a landmark site, the building's exterior cannot be altered but inside can be changed. In Harlem, uh, I think the experience of most African Americans is that um, we take care of our own churches. The church has not been in use for five years. Before it closed, the church's community of worshipers had slowly dwindled. Chisholm says at one point there was only 95 worshiping at the church, built for 1,200. The building is over 100 years old. All Saints eventually had to borrow money to pay for ongoing structural issues. I regret that All Saints is closed. That is a commentary on, on our neighborhood. CSC has not announced their plan for the building. Sapphire Quarter, NTD News, New York. Italian-American groups and a city councilman are suing Philadelphia's mayor for trying to remove the legacy of Christopher Columbus from the city. They say the mayor is being racially discriminatory against Italian-Americans. NTD's Don Tran has the details. A Philadelphia council member and several Italian-American groups are suing Mayor Jim Kenney for his alleged divisive anti-Italian-American discriminatory actions. The city toppled the statues of Christopher Columbus and Italian-American mayor Frank Rizzo. That's because Rizzo is accused of being a racist and pushing abusive police policies. And Columbus is accused by some of committing genocide against the indigenous people in America. This past February, the mayor replaced Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. 
The group says the mayor is violating the constitution, which prohibits discrimination based on anyone's national origin. It's not equal treatment to cancel the Columbus Day holiday and replace it with some other ethnic group's holiday. In this instance, Indigenous Peoples Day. What we want to do is we want to hold him accountable for these kind of racist practices and policies. They say Indigenous people should be able to celebrate their heritage. But the change creates division because it denies Italians from doing the same. Councilman Mark Skrila said the issue isn't all about Columbus. He says the mayor violated state law when he made the decision alone, without going through a process. And we just hope that if anybody you know, decides to do something like this in the future, they will include the uh, public in that process and uh, making sure that uh, all views are heard before a final decision is made. And then once that decision is made, no matter what side it falls on, at least the people were included in a part of that process. And then we would have to live with it, be angry with it or move on. But we would know that it was done properly. The lawsuit was filed in a U.S. district court, and their case is meant to hopefully stop discrimination from happening again in the city. Now, who knows which community is going to be next, which ethnic group is going to be next for him to attack. At the very least, the lawsuit seeks to repeal the name change to Columbus Day. Philadelphia's mayor said in a statement he can't comment further at this time. Don Tran, NTD News. New Yorkers are set to resume surfing, building sandcastles, and swimming this summer. That's because Mayor Bill de Blasio announced beaches and pools are opening on time this year. Last year, public beach reopenings were delayed until July because of lockdowns. New York's eight public beaches are set to open Memorial Day weekend. Outdoor pools are set to open on June 26th, the day after schools get out for the summer. De Blasio says these beautiful outdoor spaces mean so much to New Yorkers, especially after the year we've all had. He says they'll continue to follow health guidelines. This year, there won't be a cherry blossom parade on Constitution Avenue in D.C., but enthusiasts have come up with a way to keep the tradition alive. Neighborhoods across the Washington, D.C. area will be part of the new Petal Porch Parade. Residents can decorate their homes with cherry blossom arts and crafts. We just want to make sure that, you know, we can bring the cherry blossoms to the community. If, if people weren't comfortable going down to the Tidal Basin, we want to make sure that people still get to celebrate the, the greatest celebration of springtime with the National Cherry Blossom Festival this year. The festival committee selected 10 local artists to design and paint 10 cars with a cherry blossom springtime theme. The artists have been painting the cars throughout the week at the University of the District of Columbia. My design was selected. My, it's called Spring is in the Air. And it's going to be, this minivan is going to be covered with kites because kite flying seems like springtime to me. This weekend, the procession will drive by homes across the D.C. area. The parade is part of a three-week-long festival celebrating spring. Two NASA astronauts spoke with a group of students gathered around the world. The young minds are studying at the Space Institute while the astronauts are floating miles above in orbit. Floating on board the International Space Station, NASA astronauts Shannon Walker and Kate Rubens took questions from the young minds of the Space Institute. The students were from Houston, Scotland and Ecuador and asked the astronauts what it's like to go to space. My question for NASA is how do you mentally and physically prepare for a long-term space mission? Um, you just need to be ready and everybody prepares for that differently. Physically, you've got to be in shape to be able to do spacewalks, to be able to take the loads of launching and landing. And so we actually work with athletic trainers before we leave uh, Earth to make sure we're in the best physical shape we can be before we get up here. My question is, could a disease ever evolve in space and could it reach the Earth? But it's very unlikely that any new viruses would evolve up here because we don't have any other people besides the few that are up here and we don't have any animals. And that's really how viruses evolve uh, on Earth and that's how they transmit on Earth. They also asked them how the pandemic changed what the planet looked like from space. Rubin said she did notice some changes. And we have noticed, um, you know, if you look at, at things like commercial air travel, uh, very early on the number of, of flights going across we can see the trails that the airplanes leave. That's reduced, and then some of the lights in the city are reduced because of the pandemic. The two astronauts said they took part in the online event because they think it's incredibly important to get young people involved in space science. Coming up, California's governor says the state will fully reopen its economy on June 15th, but masks will still need to be worn. 
and a Texas attorney is suing e-cigarette company Juul for targeting young people with deceptive marketing. That and more on NTD News. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explained life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-509-8500. Coventry Direct, redefining insurance. The glory of piano masterpieces from the Baroque, classical, and romantic periods. New Tang Dynasty Television invites you to join the 2021 NTD International Piano Competition. Together, we preserve and revitalize the art of authentic classical piano music. October 2021 in New York City. Register now at piano.ntdtv.com. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. An attorney in Texas is suing e-cigarette company Juul for deceptive marketing. NTD's Eileen Eng has the story. A Texas attorney is suing e-cigarette company Juul and its executives for targeting young people with deceptive marketing. A statement from the attorney's office claims that Juul's vaping devices are designed to look high-tech to attract young people, and even comes in kid-friendly flavors like mango and cool mint. In an email response to NTD, Juul said it is cooperating with attorneys, health officials, and others to earn their trust. Juul reduced its product portfolio, stopped advertising, and submitted a pre-market tobacco product application to the FDA. Upon entering Juul's website, visitors are first asked if they are over 21 years of age. If the visitor isn't, the site will be redirected to a smoking prevention site. The Harris County attorney is also suing Altria, a cigarette giant that owns 35% of Juul. The lawsuit alleges that Altria played a key role in helping Juul's marketing tactics. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. California's governor has announced the state could fully reopen on June 15th. NTD's Eileen Ang has the details. Is on Tuesday, Governor Gavin Newsom announced that California will fully reopen its economy on June 15th. That's the plan as long as the state has enough vaccines and hospitalization rates are low and stable. California has administered 20 million vaccines, including 4 million to communities that are hit hardest. Right now, most of the state is at a moderate risk level. We anticipate over 30 million people will have been vaccinated at least one dose by the end of the calendar month, with the expectation of an abundance of doses coming in from the federal government through the end of this month and into May. We can confidently say by June 15th that we can start to open up as business as usual. He said Californians will still need to wear masks. His decision came after the recall effort surpassed 2.1 million signatures, threatening his position as governor. The recall effort gained momentum as the lockdowns continued throughout last year. So there's the, in the sense that he, he appeared to be making all decisions by himself. There's the policy side, but there's also the side that people just don't like this governor. They think he's arrogant. They think he's hypocritical because of the fact that he continues to do things or did going to expensive restaurants, being out flouting his own rules. And that kind of hypocrisy is not easy to come back from when you're a governor. 
The recall movement also cites issues he did not fix during his administration. There's the issue of the wildfires, the inability to provide consistent electricity, the water issues, there is homelessness, there is the highest poverty. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, California saw about 145,000 unemployment claims last week. That's an increase of almost 39,000 compared to the prior week. Eileen Ng, NTD News, California. Coming up, a tragedy strikes in China over a failed GPS system. A truck driver there committed suicide after receiving a $300 traffic fine, the final straw following years of driver mistreatment. And the Chinese regime is mandating every theater to show at least two propaganda movies per week. But those films are suffering low ticket sales. That and more on NTD News. A truck driver in China got fined $300 simply because his GPS system got disconnected. The driver ended his own life when authorities failed to understand it wasn't his fault. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more. A $300 fine marked the final straw for a truck driver in northern China. The man committed suicide earlier this week. Driver Jing Dechang drove through a trucker's checkpoint during his route on Monday. Their inspector said his Beidou navigation system, or BDS, got disconnected. The satellite GPS system is mandatory for all truck drivers in the country. So they detained his truck and gave him a $300 ticket. Jing tried to explain the disconnect wasn't his fault, but authorities paid little mind. Having reached the end of his rope, Jing purchased a highly toxic pesticide from a nearby store and ended his life. He left a suicide note explaining what pushed him over the edge. Jing wrote that he was 51. He has been a hardworking truck driver for 10 years, but earned little. He also often got sick and had health problems, but still had to keep working. He reiterated that it's not the driver's fault when the BDS disconnects and noted that the quality of the system has proved a nightmare for truck drivers. He wrote, it's not that my life isn't worth $300. I do this to speak out for the majority of truck drivers. I hope my death will spark leaders' attention on this matter. He drank the pesticide while inside a corridor near the inspector's office area, but he wasn't sent to the hospital until the last moment of his life. His brother later learned that Jing had posted a video on a truck driver chatting group. In the clip, Jing said it had been 10 minutes since he drank the pesticide, but that no one took notice. His brother also discovered later that there's only $900 in Jing's bank account. Information surrounding Jing's death has caught the public eye online. Under pressure from public opinion, officials confirmed that it did happen, claiming that related departments are investigating and will update. Many netizens are voicing outrage that officials hand out tickets and fines for minor offenses. One user posted, the regime has to keep a bunch of thugs in order to expand its power. Its financial resources are sustained by these fines. The BDS navigation system was developed in China, designed as global competition to American-made GPS systems. It's widely believed that the Chinese Communist Party aims to use it to reduce its dependence on GPS, especially for its military. On the roads, any driver who fails to install the system won't be granted a trucking operating license. Drivers also have to pay heavy installation fees and annual maintenance fees in order to access it. If a trucker is found to have disconnected from the system, they can face fines of up to nearly $800. Another online user commented on the related technical problems, saying if the BDS system got disconnected, it's the BDS that needs to compensate the drivers, not the opposite. These drivers are really hardworking. This world is no longer for humans. It's the devil's world. An article posted online notes that instead of saying safe trip or drive safe, Chinese truck drivers often remind each other to check their BDS connections before departing. The CCP is re-releasing about eight propaganda movies to celebrate its anniversary this year. But Chinese moviegoers don't seem to be very excited about them. According to China's box office ranking, those propaganda movies, or red movies, are one of the worst in terms of ticket sales. Two of them appeared at the bottom of a list of almost 200 films screened this year. The rest don't even show up because not enough people have watched them. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the CCP's founding. The regime is reportedly mandating public screenings of red movies. 
Each theater in China has to play at least two red movies per week. Theater owners can choose from 12 of them. Most of the movies were filmed decades ago. One of the 12 red films portrays Chinese communist soldiers fighting against the U.S. in the Korean War. What it doesn't say is that the communist side lost over two million soldiers during the Korean War. The film also claims the U.S. supported the so-called South Korean invasion of communist North Korea. But historians widely believe it was the Soviet Union-backed North Korea that invaded South Korea. In the meantime, Chinese authorities delayed the re-release of the Lord of the Rings series. Instead, many theaters will show red movies. One Chinese netizen wrote, Garbage is just garbage. It'll never turn into gold. Many Chinese fans of the Lord of the Rings series are disappointed that they have to wait longer now. On the other hand, a new Hollywood film, Godzilla vs. Kong, became a blockbuster in China. Its ticket revenue has reached the equivalent of over $150 million as of Wednesday. It's now one of the top five this year. Coming up, Burma's ambassador to the UK says he was locked out of the London embassy by representatives of the military junta. Protesters gather outside the embassy calling on the British government to step in. And Britain's iconic red phone booths are getting repurposed as coffee stands and other useful things. Find out more in just a moment. On The first meeting in a year between the EU's head commissioner and Turkey's president has been marred by a diplomatic incident. The Turkish president is under fire after leaving his guest with no chair to sit on. Our France correspondent David Vivez has the details. When EU head commissioner Ursula von der Leyen entered the meeting room where she was to speak with the Turkish president, she took a pose. Unlike the Turkish president, who hosted the meeting, and the EU president, Charles Michel, she had no chair to sit on. She finally had to step back and sit on the sofa at some distance from the two men. It's a move that's been branded a humiliation in French media. There are strict protocols for this kind of meeting. We see van der Leyen looking for where to sit. This is very unpleasant and a lack of courtesy from Erdogan, but also from the EU president who could have lent his chair to Ms. van der Leyen. Turkey's officials said this was not a mistake and put the responsibility onto EU administrators who organized the event. Billion says the meeting was set to reconcile the EU and Turkey, who have had harsh relations for about a year. The relationships between EU and Turkey has deteriorated to the point of being despicable over the past year. It seems both sides are trying now to seek new ground for agreement. The incident was instantly branded Sofagate on Twitter. An EU spokesperson said von der Leyen is concerned by the incident, but she preferred to focus on the goal of the meeting. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Burma's ambassador to the UK urged the British government not to recognize the junta's envoy and send them back after he was locked out of the embassy by representatives of the military. NTD's Neil Woodrow has more. I'm outside the Burmese embassy in London where around 50 protesters have been calling for democracy and for the military attaché inside to get out. 
On Wednesday, Kozo Amin, Burma, also known as Myanmar's ambassador to the UK, was locked out of his embassy by military attaché and had to spend the night in his car. The ambassador said through a spokesman that after the military coup in February, he was recalled by the military regime. Since then, he has stopped following Burma's foreign ministry's instructions. There was a coup in Myanmar in February, now in a similar situation in central London. UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab condemned the bullying actions of the military regime and paid tribute to the ambassador's courage. The ambassador, through his spokesman, is standing defiant. Yes, we have full faith in the UK government not to recognize the military council of Myanmar and not to follow the military council request to install Dr. Chewin as the Chengdi uh, affair, but to stand with the democratically elected government of Myanmar and its people. In a letter to the British Foreign Ministry from the Myanmar Embassy seen by Reuters, those in control of the embassy said that Deputy Ambassador Chit Win had taken over as charged affair as of Wednesday. The BBC reports that the UK has accepted the changes. Outside the embassy, protesters are calling for the UK government to help them and chanting slogans, stop killing our people right now, right now, China gains, Burma pays. One protester from Burma says it's unacceptable that their country's embassy is seized by the military. We are quite afraid that if this military attaché successfully seized the army's embassy in UK, the similar situation is going to happen in different countries because, you know, it is like a coup in a central land and yeah. Thant tells NTD most Burmese believe China secretly supports the junta and provides IT technicians and workforce to the military. After the military coup earlier this year, Kuo Min called for Burma's ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi to be released. Since the military coup, over 600 anti-coup demonstrators have been killed, according to some Burma media. The protesters say they hope the situation can be turned around for the future of all Burmese. Neil Woodrow, NTD News, London. As the UK government reviews the idea of a pass that would prove your COVID-19 status, there's concerns fraudsters may advertise fake ones. Here's NTD's Jane Worrell with more. With cyber fraud on the rise since pandemic restrictions, concerns that fraudsters may start forging vaccine certificates. The government hasn't confirmed whether a domestic passport scheme will be launched in the UK, but it's piloting the idea at some large events. You've got to be very careful in how you handle this and, and don't uh, start a system that's, that's uh, discriminatory. Um, but obviously we're looking at it. The Prime Minister said that domestic vaccine passports won't be introduced on April the 12th or May the 17th. Those are the next reopening dates. But he certainly hasn't ruled it out. Michael Gove is currently reviewing the idea. Meanwhile, the banking trade body says that scammers are likely to adapt their ways and may start targeting people by advertising fake COVID certificates. The passes could prove a challenge to authenticate. There are essentially three points at which it can go wrong. It might not be the person who's been tested. It might not be the person who owns the certificate and the certificate in itself might be entirely fake. But he says proving the authenticity of certificates could come in a way that compromises other freedoms. I think at the very deepest level, um, to get this to get this working perfectly, you need a complete biometric based uh, identity system working. That's an enormous cost to society. Uh, it means it means that you would introduce uh, uh, you would you would know who who is who is whom from from facial recognition or something like that at any point in any place. Slightly more authoritarian governments. Uh, would be would be inclined to abuse these systems once they're in place. Some have suggested younger people wanting to go to large events may be a target for scammers. Fraud experts have cautioned people if vaccine certificates are introduced to get them from an official source. Jane Werrell, NTD News, London. They might not be used for calls anymore, but the iconic British red phone booths are still popular. Check out this repurposed one in London. One can argue it's the smallest coffee shop in the city. Visitors can grab a tiramisu on one side and an espresso on the other. The barista says the well-known booth attracts lots of customers, and there might be more innovative redesigned booths coming soon. The British Telecom is selling them to the communities and entrepreneurs for about $2. Some of them have already been converted into mobile phone charging stations, mini smartphone repair shops, and even 
an online bakery. Up next, a so-called dying town in Italy is seeking help from UNESCO's World Heritage to keep it alive. The town's mayor explains why the resilient area is facing difficulties. The adoration of the mystic lamb returns to St. Babo's Cathedral in the Belgian city of Ghent. The Renaissance masterpiece also gets some extra protection. Stay tuned to find out more. North of Rome, there's a charming Italian town with a history of some 3,000 years, but now it's fighting to survive. Locals are hoping a nod from UNESCO will help turn things around. This is Italy's so-called dying town. This picture-perfect hillside town of Civita di Bagnoreggio is 3,000 years old, but it's unstable and vulnerable to collapse. It's been reduced to a third of its original size due to erosion, earthquakes and landslides that have chipped away at its edges. Luca Profili is the town mayor. Our motto is resilience because Civita was founded by Etruscans, passed through the Roman era and the entire medieval period to reach the present day. This place is so fragile because the problem it faces is its geomorphological conformation. The cliff is made of clay and tufo, and it is always subject to atmospheric agents, rain and winds that have totally changed its appearance in recent years. The town is now only 500 feet long, 300 feet wide, and only accessible via a footbridge. But its inhabitants have gone to great lengths to preserve their beloved home. They've built seven structural wells underground around its perimeter, which have hundreds of steel rods attached to the hillside rock to prevent it from collapsing. Geologist Luca Constanti said that if these measures hadn't been taken, it's likely the town would have completely disappeared by now. This is the heart of our interventions. As you can see, we are surrounded by all these cracks in the rock because the rock tends to break near the edges of the city. All this mass of rock, which is more or less all broken and tends to collapse on the edges, is kept together by these wells and by these steel rods, which exactly like plugs in a wall, hold everything back. Tourism has been pivotal in the town's struggle to survive. It went from 40,000 tourists a year in 2009 to over a million in 2019, according to the mayor. This brought new jobs and a financial boost thanks to the €5 Euro entrance fee. That income helps fund the structural monitoring system that helps hold the town up. It also means residents don't have to pay municipal taxes. Of course, the past year of lockdowns and international travel bans have been challenging. But, Profili said, visitors from within Italy have still been able to visit and support the conservation. And there's one more reason to be hopeful. Civita di Bagnoreggio and the surrounding valley are a candidate to become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Achieving such a status would likely bring the international attention and tourism the town needs in order to hold out a little longer. A restored 15th century masterpiece gains new bulletproof glass housing in Belgium this week. That's after a long life of being painted over, partly stolen, and at one point, hidden by Nazis. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. The beefed-up protection is part of a $35 million revamp for visitors. The Adoration of the Mystic Lamb is an altarpiece featuring 12 detailed panels, completed in 1432 by brothers Jan and Hubert van Eyck. It's widely considered one of the most important pieces of early Renaissance art. The Belgian city of Ghent planned to host the van Eyck last year, with the altarpiece fully returned to St. Bavos Cathedral after more than a decade of restoration. But I think the, the most important reason was the restoration campaign. And then it was really decided that we, we couldn't go on with a visitor uh, experience like that because it didn't match the, the virtuosity of the, the van Eyck brothers. There were often complaints about, about the, the display case, the lighting, etc. But the pandemic pushed that into 2021. The panels were partially painted over in 1550 and later sawn in half in the 19th century. That was to separate the paintings on the double-sided panels. They were taken by invading French and German forces during different wars, ending up in an Austrian salt mine at the end of World War II. 
Two panels were stolen in 1934, but only one was recovered. That story of the stolen Just Judges panel appeals so much to people's imaginations. That panel was stolen in 1934, and people have been looking for it since. The panel titled Just Judges is a 1945 replica. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Steve Lance, filling in for Stephania Cox. a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.